as we've alluded to, today is Easter Sunday, a day that's recognized and celebrated by the majority of the world, the Christian world especially, as being the day that um, Christ rose. And while it's not the literal day, it is, out of all the holidays, the closest that's related to the day in which he would have risen. And um, it's one of those blessings where we get to not just be with family, but we get to be purposely with family. We get to stand and use it as a reminder to our children of the wonder and the greatness of that resurrection and how that resurrection offers us many things as well. And it brings the opportunity as Christians and as a church to reach out and to share with people who may not otherwise listen, who may not otherwise know much about Christ, where we can begin sharing about him and sharing what led up to this resurrection and sharing with maybe non-Christians why this day in history is vital. And um, it helps us to reach out and share that Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, we live as well. This morning, I want us to look at several verses. I want to start with John chapter 11. In verse 17 through 27, it reads, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Lazarus is someone that Jesus loved dearly, and uh, he had died. And they had called Jesus, and Jesus kind of came, but he took his time, if you read the narrative before this, he took his time getting to Lazarus to heal him from his sickness. And so when he arrived, Lazarus had already been there for four days, buried in the tomb. In verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, Lazarus. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Isn't that an amazing statement of faith? Whatever you, I know Lazarus is dead. Whatever you ask of God, though, he will do for you. And Jesus said in verse 23, your brother will rise again. In verse 24, Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So much is made in this one small statement by Christ, not just the prediction of his resurrection once again, but the prediction of our resurrection. When we come to Christ, when we come to know Christ, if I start squeaking, I apologize. I'm still getting my voice back. I came armed today. Jesus Christ gives us life. He rose from the dead so that we might rise from the grave as well. He rose from the grave so that we might have hope that this life is not all that there is, that there is something more, there is something beyond this life. He rose from the dead to give not just us hope, but to give the hopeless hope. <laughs> Jesus is alive and he makes us alive. He is the living Savior. He brings us life in several ways and he offers us several things. And he says, he is the resurrection and life. If you believe in him, even though you die, you will live. You live in two different ways when it comes to Christ. You live, yes, eternally after you pass from this world and you go into your eternal home. But he brings life in the midst of this life. In fact, we're going to get into this later on, but in John 10... Jesus says, I come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. <coughs> he offers us several things. The first thing he gives us in this life is a peaceful life. He gives us a peaceful life on this earth. 
Now, his understanding of peace is not always our understanding of peace. Our understanding of peace is often that understanding that everything has to be rainbows and butterflies. Nothing ever puts a ripple in the pond of our life. There's never a harm or a struggle that happens to us. But that's not what Jesus is saying when he says, I give you a peaceful life. <coughs> what he is saying is, I give you peace in the midst of a chaotic life. He gives us, for example, peace of mind. In Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when the world is in chaos, we can have peace in our minds. We can be at peace in our hearts. We have peace in our life. In John 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. I leave my peace. I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You see, <coughs> excuse my coughing, guys. <clears throat> Maybe I should put three of those things in my mouth. You see, when we get into this idea of living in peace, it's that when the world is crumbling around us, we can be at peace. We can be trusting in God. We're not chicken little running around. There's too many Christians out there that are acting like chicken riddle, little, running around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the government is collapsing, whatever it might be. And it shows anything but peace. It doesn't demonstrate the peaceful life. Christ came to give us peace in life. Matthew 6, <coughs> verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But, in God, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not be anxious. What's he saying? I came to give you peace. You don't have to worry. God is there. He is caring for you. He gives us a peaceful life. But he gives us a joyful life as well. Not only do we get peace in our life, but we get joy. Christians ought to be joyful people. <coughs> the truth is, Christians should not walk around moping every day of their life. That doesn't mean hard things don't happen. That doesn't mean that we don't tell people when we're struggling. But in the midst of our struggles, we ought to have the joy of Christ. Paul writes about this. And while I didn't put it up, Paul talks about in the midst of his imprisonment, he still sees the positive. In the midst of his imprisonment, he writes the Philippian church. He says, don't worry about my situation. He says, I'm not. In fact... My being locked up, if you will, my persecution has made more be so much bolder for the kingdom of God in their preaching. And he says, don't worry about me. Philippians 4, 7, he says, in fact, be optimistic. That which is upright, that which is true, that which is holy, all these things, think about them. As Christians, we ought to be joyful. I helped you out there. Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Notice full, fullness of joy. Not just fun. Not just happy one day, sad the next. But true joy. Filled with joy in life. You ever met someone who's filled with the joy of God? 
you love being around them, don't you? And it's not that they're happy and bubbly where you want to punch them in the face because they don't ever like calm it down. It's you want to be around them because they are joyful people. They make you happier being in their presence. That's what we're called to do. To have that joy of the Lord radiating out of us. Having that joyful life Christ offered us through his resurrection so that others want to be around us. We have to change the tide, church. We live in a world that despises the church, despises Christians. And who would blame them? Look at a lot of the people going out that are saying they're Christians. They're jerks. We are called to be joyful people. People who love God. Because God says, not only do I give you peace, but I give you fullness of joy. But he doesn't force it upon us, does he? We have to choose it. And that means regardless of whatever circumstances we face, whatever struggle we face, we find God in it. That doesn't mean when someone asks you how are things going, that you have to say, everything's going fine and put on your facade. What it means is, even in the midst of your hardship, even when you're crying, even when you're struggling, even when you're questioning, you receive joy. I know that's easier said than done. But that begins by having joy before the trials start. You see, trials bring out what's underneath in us, right? When I do counseling, one of the things that we talk about when clients are getting better before we release is we talk about things are going good. Keep practicing what we've talked about because when things go bad, it's too late to start practicing these things. In other words, when things go bad, if you haven't already created these good habits, had this joy in your life, it's going to expose what's really underneath. But if you can get the habits down, and have that joy and take hold of that joy, take hold of that peace before trials, you will stand firmer within the trials. Now that doesn't mean it can't be developed in trial. But it means it can be a lot stronger and strengthening in the midst of the trial. Christ brings us peace. He brings us joy. In Psalm 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield, in Him my heart trusts. I have helped my heart exalt in my song. With my song, I give thanks to him. There's a song that we sing occasionally, The Joy of the Lord. And I love it because it reminds me of how joyous our life is when we're in Jesus Christ. But the resurrection doesn't stop there. You see, the resurrection brought about peace. The resurrection brought about joy. It also brings about forgiveness. The resurrection offers us a forgiven life. We've been forgiven. Isn't that amazing? What other reason to have joy? What other reason to have peace? Doesn't matter what we did in our old life. When we come to Christ, when we're baptized, when we're forgiven of our sins, when we receive the Spirit, in our eternal home, when we tell God that I am going to live for you, we've been forgiven. We didn't earn it. We received it. And that brings us peace because we don't have to worry about what others say. We know that Christ has taken care of our sin. We don't have to worry about our eternal home. We know that Christ has given us a home. We know that we're the children of God. So we have peace. And that forgiveness is also what gives us the joy. We've all probably been in a situation where we've received something we didn't feel we were worthy of getting. Maybe you've been in the situation where somebody forwent a consequence you were supposed to receive. And you were just so thankful because they had forgiven you of that. I like to watch YouTube, which most people under 40 love, apparently. And 
on YouTube, there's, I don't even know the guy's name, but there's this judge that's in Rhode Island, and I'm sure it's a big pre TV production, and it's all made up and fabricated just like everything else is. But it makes me happy because these people will come in, and instead of being like some of these other shows where these judges are like hardcore and really upset and mean and so forth, this guy comes in and, man, and it kind of makes me miss my Italian friends from up north hearing him talk. But this guy comes in, and he just forgives people. And it shows you a different side to the legal system. It shows grace and mercy. And some of these people, I'm going to pretend like it's real. You guys can believe what you want. It makes me joyful to pretend this is real. Some of these people get so emotional. I mean, they didn't go off and like off somebody or something like that. You know, these are violations and they're in hard times and they just got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with the ticket or whatever. And they deserved it. But sometimes in their honesty, the judge will look at them and he'll say, basically he'll grant them forgiveness of that. And then he'll build them back up and you just watch them become emotional at the relief they feel because of the forgiveness he's given. We stand in front of a courtroom And we stand before the ultimate judge who is God. And we have to give an account, not just of our faith and belief, we have to give an account of our deeds, Scripture says. And when you're a Christian, when you've done what he's asked you to do, you've lived an imperfect life, but you've tried your best, and you've followed him the best you could. He looks at your deeds, and he says, they weren't good enough, but I forgive you for it. And even though you didn't live good enough, welcome home. You see, if we truly understand the forgiveness we receive, it gives us peace. It gives us joy in our lives. 1 John 1, verses 7 and through 9 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from not just some sin, but what? All. Let's say it all together. Not some, but all. Isn't that amazing? All of our sin. If we say we have no sin, though, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the forgiveness that we've been given, the forgiven life, is only when we fess up and say, I have messed up. It only works if we're truthful. In fact, if you keep reading, it says those who deceive themselves, they don't receive the forgiveness. It's only those who fess up to God. And this doesn't mean you have to go to a priest. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to tell other people your sin. You have to tell God that you recognize where you've messed up. Yes, we forget sins. Yes, we don't catch sins, especially if you're not a Christian or if you're a brand new Christian. You will sin, and you won't even know it's a sin sometimes until later. And then you're reading Scripture and like, oh, no, I didn't realize that was wrong. But you know what? When you realize it was wrong, and then you change what you've been doing, and you confess to God, hey, God, I didn't know it doesn't excuse me, but I'm not going to do that again. Once again, God says, I have forgiven you. We are given a forgiven life, and ultimately that leads not just to a peaceful and joyful life, it leads to an eternal life, doesn't it? Just as Christ was raised from the grave, we are raised from the grave into eternal life. John three sixteen through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, would have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I love this passage. It is misused and abused today, but I love it so much because it gives us the hope 
of eternal life. In verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. You see, this is why it's often misused, and that's not the sermon this morning, but because they stop at verse 16. Maybe they go to verse 17. They don't realize that works are integrated into this belief. James says it too, right? Faith without works is dead. This is the judgment. In verse 20, then he says, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. So it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers us eternal life, but only if we believe in him, in his resurrection, in who he claims to be, but only if we do something with that belief. You see, this is often used to say you don't have to get baptized to become a Christian. Let's throw out the Bible verses that say that. But even Jesus says, even the demons believe. It's what you do with that belief, right? We can believe Jesus offers us peace. We can believe that Jesus offers us joy. We can believe that he offers us forgiveness. We can believe that he offers us eternal life. But if we don't do what he has asked, he says you won't receive any of that. Second Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That new is newness of life, new creature, a new being. Not just on this earth, but in eternity as we live with God. The resurrection of Christ offers us peace. It offers us joyfulness. It offers us forgiveness. And it offers us eternal life in heaven. But we have to accept it. He won't shove it on any of us. We accept it in not just our belief, not just our words, but in what we do and how we follow his teaching. Christ is alive and he came, John 10, 10 says, to give that life to you so that we might give that life to others. I've got a few questions. First of all, have you received the life he gives you? Have you studied what he has written, what he is, his love letter, if you will, to you in scripture, to see what he says about life, about resurrection, Have you obeyed on his terms, not your terms, the receiving of that by being baptized, by living a life filled with the Spirit, filled with godly works? If you've been a Christian, become a Christian, are you Living, are you still living the life God has given you? Are you still living as someone who is alive, not dead? Someone who lives in that newness of life, not the oldness of life? Or have you dropped back to your old ways? And finally, if you're a Christian, Christians get two questions. Are you sharing that life with other people? Are you giving that life to others? Are you telling them about a Savior who came not just to die, but he came to rise to life so that we might rise to life? Not just only in eternity, but even in the midst of our lives on earth. Are you giving the same life that you have received through Christ?